I like to explain what is life. Then I will explain what is Buddhism. Then I will tell you how to merge, how to join life and Buddhism together. Life. Many people believe that this body is our life. This is not the life. Body is the house for that life to exist. So life exists in this house. We use this house to provide necessities for that life to survive. But unfortunately, many people have not yet realized this because they concentrate more on physical goods, forget about their life. Whole day and night, they use their full effort to maintain this physical body. Feeding, washing, cleaning, decorating, beautifying, but they never think about life. But we have to think about life also. As we need cleaning and washing to maintain this physical body, Remember, life also needs cleaning and washing and decorating. Because we have been accumulating, collecting lot of rubbish in our life. By decorating this body, by feeding this body, the life cannot endure. Life never gain anything. We must attend to our life. What is it? Now we have to study how this life come into existence. This is a very big problem. Because different religious groups give different interpretation. Scientists give another interpretation. Free thinkers or rationalists give another interpretation. Agnostic, those who don't like religion, give another interpretation. It's a very complicated subject to find out how the life comes into action. When this question was put to the Buddha, what did he say? He said, you should not waste your valuable life by observing, studying, thinking to find out the beginning of this life, because there is no beginning. You can spend your whole lifetime to study how the life was originated. You can study a little bit. Now let us take scientific interpretation given by Charles Darwin according to his theory of evolution. To him, life started from amoeba in the water, one cell, life, then went on evolving, evolving, developing and developing and developing, and today we stand as human beings. 
but he has no knowledge about the mental process, the development of mental process. He knew, he studied, he observed only elemental science. Therefore, element alone cannot change the life. Mental energy also important. So in the Buddha's teaching, it is mentioned that these two join together. And then the evolution takes place. Combinations of mind and matter. Scientists had a belief earlier that mind is the byproduct of the element or the matter. When all the elements combine together, mind started to develop as a byproduct of the matters of element. Later, a well-known scientist, Albert Einstein, all the other scientists respect him. He has said, matters alone cannot produce a life. Matters cannot produce a life without a mind. Mental energy must be there for those elements to deal. Then the formation of life takes place. Now let us refer to the Buddha, what he has. When somebody dies, his or her mental process of consciousness, in that consciousness there are so many ingredients. So this consciousness transmit from here. When it is transmitted, external energies, cosmic energies, elements, combine, absorb. Now then, either in the mother's womb or somewhere else, another life will be ordinary. So after developing and developing and developing, then decaying and decaying, decaying, and that life again depart from there. When that departed person's consciousness again transmitted from there, enter into another area, according to that person's way of life, karma. So, life processes are going on changing, changing, evolving and evolving according to our mental process, karmic energies, mental attitude. So the elements and cosmic energies support. And that is why the Buddha says there is no beginning. But many others cannot satisfy. They say there must be a beginning. Therefore, existing religions believe life is created by God. Formerly we never had a life. So this is the first and the last. Therefore, you must follow, you must listen 
to that God. Otherwise, your life will be in danger. You have no salvation. Now this is the concept or the belief maintained by many religions. Earlier, there was another religion, one of the ancient religion in this world, Hinduism. Hinduism says, God create the soul and this soul goes down, going on entering into the plants and animals and slowly went on developing and developing and developing. The shape of human beings come into existence later. Uh, this is slightly different. But according to other religions, this human life is created by God at once. Many other rationalists who cannot satisfy with this creation, because there are many problems, they say, there is no person, there is no God to create. But here in this universe, there is something which is called universal consciousness. That is intelligent force. So all these living beings, all these matters, particles here in this world are the a unit derived from the universal consciousness, especially living beings. After they are dead, the same universal consciousness absorbs, and then it will become eternal or immortal existence. Those who do not believe in God maintain this belief. Some others, many scientists, who do not believe in God or universal consciousness, say, actually, there is no plan. This is the coincident. Accidentally, when certain elements and energies join together, the life comes into existence. Remain for a certain period, experience pain and pleasure, and again dissolve, disintegrate. After that, there is nothing. And this belief was there even in India during the Buddha. It's a well known saying in Sanskrit language what those people believe. They say, Yava Jeeve Sukham Jeeve, Rinan Kritwa Gritan Pibi. Basmi Bhutasya Dehasya Unaragamanam Yava Jive Sukham. As long as we live in this world, we must enjoy our life. Right? Very good news for young people. <laughs> if we haven't got enough money, income to enjoy, go and borrow from here and there and enjoy. Why? Vasmi Bhuta se deha se kudaragam nankrita. After our death, our body will be cremated or burned or buried. Who says there will be another life we are after? All rubbish. Very nice, isn't it? Very easy. So this belief was there even during the Buddha's time. So the Buddha has rejected this belief. 
At the same time, he did not accept the common belief that this life was created by somebody and is supernatural living being. The Buddha did not accept even that. So he had to analyze and explain what is life, what is mind, what is matter, analyze him. Then, according to him, just now I mentioned, there are numerous, endless, infinite, universes are infinite, no end. We do not know actually the real nature of this globe where we exist. Our knowledge is very, very poor. And what do we know about universes, not only one universe? In the Buddha's teaching, it is mentioned, there are thousands of suns, thousands of moons. People laughed at him when he said like this. There were thousands. And today, astronomers, those who have studied, found out there are so many suns, so many moons, but they had only very limited knowledge to understand. So not knowing the real nature of the universe, thinking that this is the only world where living beings exist, we maintain such belief that this life is at once created by someone and after our death, again, very big controversy. What will happen to us after our death? One group says, after our death, there's only heaven or hell. In between there is nothing. But some others say, why only heaven and hell? There are so many other planes of existence where living beings exist. He has mentioned or categorized into 31 groups in the whole universe. Hell, a spirit world, ghost world, human beings, different kind of devas, different kind of uh, deva are superior to ordinary devas, uh, or to the 31 groups, to lead peaceful life, to cultivate unity, harmony and understanding. All these good qualities even main qualities, when you combine together, that is called humanism. And in that humanism, we can see our duties, responsibilities, obligations, what to do and what not to do. Take for instance, now we have some duties to fulfill towards our father and mother, our wife and husband and children, our relatives and friends, our country and the nation and the government. All these are under humanism. Later, they have developed this concept of God. Then they invited the God into humanism. Later this become a religion. At the beginning there was no religion. When they invited God into humanism, they used the word religion. Then what they did? 
they introduce all these good qualities and virtues and knowledge and wisdom as if given by the God. God says you must not kill. God says you should not steal. God says you should not commit adultery. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not uh, came from God. But before they invite the God, they knew these things are wrong. Why it is necessary for them to introduce this? They knew. Without introducing in this way, people do not listen. They do not pay attention. To create fear in their mind, because this order, this law, this commandment, given by the God. If you violate this, if you break this, God will punish you. Ah, then, <laughs> otherwise you will never observe. Because they knew your mind. By thinking only about the punishment of God, they say, oh, we cannot do this, God will punish. This is more children's language. Again, when they knew that human beings are very selfish, and then they introduced, you must do some service to others. You must contribute something for the welfare and benefit of others. Don't be stingy. If you do that, the God will reward you. Oh, he is very good. God will reward us. Then you start to do something. Otherwise, nothing will. Now you can understand. This concept of God, belief in God, is very important at the beginning for people to keep away from bad things and to do some service to others. But today, there are many people who realize it is their duty, not necessary to get order from heaven, not to do all these things and to do your responsibilities and duties. And then come to the book. Now he did not adapt this technique. He did not want to create fear in your mind, saying, if you violate if you break any of those precepts, Buddhist principles, the Buddha will punish you. The God will punish you. There is no such thing in his Buddhism. Again, he has never said, if you do all these good deeds, the Buddha will reward you. Buddha come and take you to heaven. <laughs> take you to Nirvana. <laughs> what he did, he tried to make us to understand why should we keep away from bad things? Why should we do certain good deeds? Example. If you cannot understand, take only one. If killing is bad, if you cannot understand why it is bad, then think in this way. When another person come and try to kill you, how do you feel? Right? <laughs> ah, then remember, when you try to kill another person or another living being, that living being also gains the same experience. Fear, pain, tension, worries, suffering. Ah, this is more than enough for you to understand why it is bad. Not necessary to get any message or order from heaven. The Buddha speaks things like Make you to understand. On the other hand, if you say, I don't want to do this because if I do this, I have to suffer. The God will punish me. You are very selfish. You think only about your punishment. You never consider. You never think of others, how they suffer. You have never given a chance for your mind to think, to do that bad thing. 
you have to develop cruelty, anger, grudge, enmity. With polluted mind, you do something, either beating or killing or destroying or disturbing. By doing that, I create enormous suffering. Uh, then you develop your understanding, you develop your kindness, sympathy. After that, you need. You have the courage not to do it. Not because of punishment. If there is no punishment in that way, you can do any dirty, any wicked thing in this world. Because you never think of others. Think for a while. How the Buddha tried to uh, enrich our understanding regarding this religious way of life. Then we must try to understand how to make use this valuable human life. When I say this valuable human life, I have been talking, praising, appreciating human life, human values. Yesterday, when I was reading an article written by Burton Russell, a Western philosopher, he who had no religion, who hates religion, every religion, he says, religions have done more harm than good to mankind, he says. Not me. <laughs> when you observe very carefully, he is right. It is not religion. Those who handle those religious authorities created enormous sufferings, disturbances, discrimination, hostilities because of this religion. Those cunning people, selfish people who handle religions create all these discrimination, but not religion. Every religion is good. Even Buddhist. In the name of the Buddha, by selling the name of the Buddha, what people are doing? Disgrace the food. So he says, we always praise human beings. In fact, according to my observation, there is no ground whatsoever for me to tell that human life is more valuable or more important than other human beings. I got a shock. Then I also started to think. Then he says, look at those animals and other living beings. They kill, they destroy only very limited number of living beings for their survival, for their living. Otherwise, they don't disturb, allow them to live with. This word, human or manusya, Pali and Sanskrit, word, manusya, beautiful word. One who got a mind to think, to understand, to analyze, to reason now, that living being is called manusya. Now uh, here the value of human life is there. But we are abusing this because of our selfishness. Because of our craving. That is why the Buddha started from craving. He said, craving is the main cause of all our sufferings and worries and disturbances. When that craving is no more, no 
more sufferings, no more worries, no more disturbance. And now you can understand what the Buddha said is true. Anyway, uh, still it is not too late for us to adjust ourselves to lead a normal human life. We were born to this world to lead a normal human life. But we are leading an artificial life, violating natural law, going against the nature, violating basic principles, human qualities, insulting, abusing human intelligence because of that ignorance and craving. Our religion is needed here now. Why? Scientific discoveries or technology, academic knowledge, a worldly knowledge cannot train, discipline human mind, become more crazy. Let us take atom discovered by the scientists. They thought that they can make use of this energy to do wonderful thing in this world. They can convert the whole world into a paradise by using atom. What happened? By using man's selfishness and cunningness and craving, he produced atom bomb to destroy the whole world. Not only this world, even the other planet also affected. There is no any other method, any other technique in this world to discipline, to train, to culture human mind. Because that is very, very shrewd, very stubborn, very strong human mind. Religion can train this, but not bluffing. Scientific education has given the knowledge for people to analyze and understand things. Therefore we cannot use religious dogmas to create fear in the name of religion. What is happening in the West today? Many people have no religion. They don't like religion. They say, we don't like all these dogmas anymore. That's why I told you, we cannot bluff them forever in the name of religion. We have to reveal the truth. By creating fear and temptation, talking about hell and heaven. These are the two weapons they use to introduce religions. Create fear in their mind by illustrating hell. If you don't accept this, if you don't believe this, you go to hell forever. If you follow this, if you listen to this, you can go to heaven and enjoy and play Mahajong there forever. <laughs> And this is the way how they try to introduce religion. The Buddha never adapted this attitude. He never frightened you, never threatened you, telling you, I'll send you to hell if you don't follow me. You should not go and worship another teacher, I hammer you properly. <laughs> that is how some other religious people do. The Buddha they respect every religious teacher in this world. Ah, this is a good thing. What harm is there? He never said, you must come and worship and pray to me. I will take you to heaven and Nirvana. Such teaching you cannot find in Buddhism. You might have heard this story. 
very meaningful. One of the disciples, a monk, every day he come and admire the beauty of the Buddha. So one day the Buddha asked, what are you doing here? Just like watching television. <laughs> of course, no television. Yes, yes, I <laughs> then he said, oh, sir, when I look at your face, so serene, your complexion, your features, and serenity and beauty, I really enjoy. Now then, look at what the Buddha said. These are the words uttered by the Buddha. Kinte vakkali mina pujikayena dukkandena sarire. What do you gain by watching this dirty, ugly, filthy, impermanent physical Buddha? Referring to his physical body. Because the body is body. Your body and my body and Buddha's body makes no difference. You must go and kiss the Buddha's body. Sometimes very bad smell comes from his body. <laughs> and he was a to toilet. <laughs> we think the Buddha's body is holy and sacred and very nice fragrance come from the body. So we go and worship. Then the Buddha says, Yo dhammam pastati, so mam pastati. One who sees my dhamma taught by me, he can see the Buddha. You understand? So the Buddha is not in this physical body. But when you study what the Buddha said, how he advised us, and how he has shown his supreme knowledge and wisdom and purity and understanding, then we create the real Buddha in our mind. That is what he says, Yo Dhamma Pastati, one who sees the Dhamma taught by me, is the real Buddha. Now this is the nature of the Buddha. He never said, always come and worship me, pray. Instead of worshipping and praying, you must go and try to control your mind, train your mind. And then Buddha appreciates it. Alright, now, without going to deeper aspect, I try to explain the nature of our life. There are many more things to explain. Now let us come to Buddhism. What is Buddhism? In spite of various other religions, why do we try to follow this religion, which was originated in India more than 2,500 years ago? As Chinese, why do you want to worship an Indian god? I cannot understand. You cannot find out a Chinese god for you to worship. Many people ask this question. First and foremost, I can tell you, Buddha is not a god. Uh, therefore, you cannot say Buddha is an Indian god. More than 2,000 years ago, Chinese in China heard about the Buddha. They knew a wisdom, real wisdom, enlightenment appeared in India. So they have taken the trouble to send pilgrims to India few hundred years after the Buddha to study what the Buddha taught, to find out the nature of this religious way of life. They have done this on many occasions. After studying this religion, staying there many years, they have returned they have gone there at the risk of their life at that time, from China to India, distant, desert, jungles. Many of them died on the way. 
So they wholeheartedly accepted this religion, which was originated in India, because the Buddha's message is not for Indians. Remember, that is a message for the whole mankind. Universal values you can find in the Buddha. There is nobody in this world who can say, oh, this teaching is good for Indians, only in India. What happened? They had two religious beliefs in China. But they found out there are many more new concepts in the Buddha's teaching which they could not find out in theism or Confucian. The scholars do not regard these two things as religions. Karma, cause and effect, rebirth, they have never heard anything. They learned these things from Buddhism. And there were many new concepts that they never heard earlier. That is why at once they accepted. Later, Buddhism became a major religion in China. After that, they introduced the other part of the world. So what is Buddhism? Just now I told you, Buddha's message is universal message. If anybody asks this question, what is Buddhism? Very easily you can give the answer. Remember. He says, Sabha Papas Akarana. Try to keep away from bad deeds. So not only for Indians. Kusanasa Upasampada. Do good deeds or do some service to others. Sajitta Pariyoda Parana. Try to train and try to purify your own mind. Etam Buddha This is the message of every Buddha. That means many Buddhas appeared earlier from time to time. There will be many more. But all those Buddhas give the same message. They have no different doctrine different message. That is why they are known as Buddha. Now, this is the answer. People say it is very difficult to study Buddhism. This is Buddhism. Don't do bad things, do good things, and try to train and purify your mind. That is Buddhism. Is there anything else? Have you heard anything else besides these three things? When we analyze these three items, there will be thousands and thousands of various items related to these three. What are the bad deeds? Are they analyzed? What are the good deeds? Analyzed. What is the mind that we are going to train and purify? How to purify this mind? What is the method? Then you can understand. When you enlarge these three lines. Now here, belief in God, belief in the Buddha, praying and worshipping to anybody, offerings and uh, performing religious rites and rituals are not there. The Buddha was not interested in all those things. To him, religion means keep away from bad things, do good things, 
maintain healthy mind, then religious way of life. Now you see to understand, isn't it? No. What are the bad things? To do bad things, we have to create bad thoughts in the mind. There must be either craving or selfishness or anger or jealousy or enmity or misunderstanding. There must be some sort of evil thought in the mind. Then we do bad with that polluted mind. Then it will become bad karma. We commit bad karma if we do bad things with polluted mind. Then can arise. To do good things, we have to create good thoughts. There must be kindness, compassion, sympathy, understanding, cooperation, harmony. By cultivating all these good qualities, we do some service to others. Then it will become good karma. And this is the nature of bad karma and good karma. Accidentally, that means unintentionally, without creating an idea in our mind that we want to do this. So accidentally, we do certain bad things. They are not under this category because we have not polluted our mind. Accidentally we do some service to others also. If we have not created some good thoughts in our mind to do this intentionally, that cannot become good karma. And this is the nature of bad karma or bad deeds, good karma and good deeds. And that is not enough. You can say you are you are a good Buddhist because you don't do bad things. That is not enough. If you stop your religious way of life simply by keeping away from bad things, the other side is dark. What is that? What is that? You have to do some service to others. You have to devote your time to release others' suffering, fear, disturbances, worries, sicknesses. There are so many ways for us to do some service to others, to release their suffering. Uh, so we have to fulfill both. Keep away from bad things and do good things. Also not here. You can say you are a very good Buddhist because you don't do bad things and you are doing a lot of good deeds, therefore you are a good Buddhist. But there is no guarantee. That is the nature of the mind. Because by controlling your weaknesses, by controlling your anger and greed and jealousy, you have you try to keep away from bad things, you try to do some good things, but still the roots of the evil thought remain in the mind. Remember. The sediment, you have suppressed them, but remain in the mind. Circumstances, Temptation or irritation stir the mind. Then you can see all your hidden craving and anger and cruelty come up. That is why I told you there is no current. When there are no such disturbances, 
is you are very good Buddhist. When you are good, I am also good. When you are bad, I can become nasty. And this is the nature. We can represent as good Buddhists in this way. When you are bad, if I can remain as good person, then I am good Buddhist. Because your irritation, your temptation could not change my mind. That is why mental training, mental purification is needed. So there is no guarantee at any moment we can change our mind. Or we can give up Buddhism also and accept another religion. When there are certain privileges, facilities, favoritism, and then you go and accept another religion. But earlier, you try to train yourself by keeping away from bad things and doing good things. Circumstances change. Uncertainty in our mind. Then, what to do now? The Buddha introduced our religious way of life by mentioning three methods. Dana Sila Bhava. We have to start from the beginning. Don't try to jump at once. You will fall down. Dana means sacrificing, donating something for the benefit of others. That is to reduce selfishness. Idea is to reduce our selfishness. We try to contribute something for the benefit of others. That is the first stage. By maintaining your selfishness or your greed, if you try to practice Buddhism, you collapse. Every now and then. That is the. Then the next item is seal. Seal means discipline. What is discipline? By nature, we are used to do bad things. Yes, it is true. A small children very easily learn bad things. Not necessary to send to school or give private tuition to learn bad things. Very easy, they learn all the dirty things. In this world. That means our minds are used to it. We have been doing this life after life. Mind is used. That is why we had to struggle, use full effort not to do bad things. To do good things is not very difficult. But not to do bad things is very difficult. You know, you try and think. Very easily you can do some good things. But not to do a bad thing, not so easy. So that means you are used to do bad things. That's why religion is sealed here. A sealer means we try to discipline that mind, train this mind to uphold certain principles certain qualities, certain virtues, then we culture our mind. At the moment, actually, our minds are very uncultured. After training, by observing these religious principles, then the last term, bhavana, meditation. We cannot meditate without reducing selfishness, without training our mind, because the mind is very wild. 
worse than wild animal. When the mind is tamed, uh, then we can concentrate. We can contemplate. We can focus our mind towards a particular object. Then go on training and training and training and training. So when we train the mind, what we do actually, all the dirt we have collected, life after life, layer upon layer, in our mind, we cleanse it. The meditation is to cleanse the mind. Reduce the dirt we have accumulated. Go on cleaning and cleaning and reducing and reducing and reducing. Then the evil thought that naturally appear in our mind, such as anger or jealousy or grudge and enmity, also go down and down and down and down. And this is the technique introduced by the Buddha for us to train the mind. When the mind becomes pure, completely purified, then we gain wisdom. Otherwise we never gain wisdom. Enlightenment. Knowledge is not wisdom. You can learn everything under the sun and the moon. You have wonderful knowledge about the world and the universe and languages and science and technology and everything. But still you have no wisdom. You are intellectual fools. That means no wisdom. But your intellect is very high. If you want to become intellectual giant, you have to purify the mind. Then you gain conviction, determination, confidence, understanding, not necessary to think deeply because you have removed all the dark clouds from your mind. Now we have to think very deeply to understand something. Mind is not clear. So many obstructions, hindrances 